today on the Perception and Action podcast. My interview with Todd Hargrove from Better Movement. How can playing with and exploring movement be beneficial? Why should we be thinking about options, not corrections, in movement training and physical therapy? What is the Feldenkrais method? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about my new book. Yes, I've written a new book on skill acquisition called How We Learn to Move, A Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills. It covers the ecological approach to skill from different angles, including practice design, the CLA, coaching, youth sports, designing technology, injury prevention, and using analytics. So I hope you will consider giving it a read. You can find the book on Amazon or by going to perceptionaction.com forward slash book. Now on to the show. In today's episode, I was happy to be joined by Todd Hargrove. Todd has his own podcast, Better Movement, which I just guested on a few weeks ago. He also has a great blog and two excellent books, A Guide to Better Movement and Playing with Movement, that I would highly recommend. In the interview, we had a great discussion about the value of exploring movement and learning to learn to move. Okay, today my guest is Todd Hargrove. Uh, thanks for joining me, Todd. Thanks, Rob. Um, to start off with, can you tell us a little bit about your background and some of the things you do? I know you, you, you're an author of multiple books and you're, you have a podcast that I was just on a few, a few couple months ago. So can you tell us a little bit about like, how you got into this? Yeah, I live here in Seattle. Uh, I'm a rolfer. That's a kind of like a deep tissue massage. I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner. That is kind of like a mindful movement therapy. I got into those things around 2005. Uh, before that, I was a lawyer for 10 years. And like when I was a lawyer, I was having some chronic pain. I was having fun competing at sports. And I just got interested in uh, coordinated movement and kind of motor control and how to become a better athlete and a better mover, you know, like using scientific principles. Because until then, it was kind of like I, I was not aware that there was really a science of any of this stuff. There was just kind of practices where you know you practice your sport or you listen to the coach but when i learned that there was kind of a science of coordinated movement and how to get more coordinated i found that kind of fascinating and so i started to study it at the same time i was studying uh how not to be in pain because i thought that my pain was related to my posture at work and i was feeling that i noticed a connection there between kind of the way i was moving and the way i was feeling and so i started kind of studying physical therapy ideas like how is pain related to movement or how is pain related to, to posture. I kind of noticed that uh, a lot of the people in the PT realm studying movement were also, were kind of talking to uh, sports coaches and they were, there was kind of like this going back and forth between the kinds of movements that make you feel good, the kinds of movements that make you play good. I got really interested in that idea enough so that I'd rather kind of study this than be a lawyer. So I, I got into uh, jobs where I could kind of study those things and help people with those things. I ended up having way less pain after doing things like, you know, yoga and Feldenkrais and, and stuff like that. And so I, you know, wanted to help people doing uh, the same thing. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I, you know, I uh, the self uh, motivation uh, find I think is a, a very common. You know, wanting to help yourself. Yeah, I was my first patient. I succeeded, <laughs> so I wanted to help other people. It's a you very know, good mode. Kind of my initial ideas, you know, really changed over time. You know, I came into it with, I guess, what you know, very conventional ideas about movement and pain that most people have that were kind of bouncing around at the time and that are still around, which is that. If you want to not be in pain, if you want to move well, there's kind of like one correct way to do it. And human bodies are like machines and you should find the right stereotype and repeat it. And, you know, as I studied and learned over time, I found lots of problems with that model. It's what led me on to kind of reading stuff by you and other people. Yeah, no, that's what you, yeah, I know you have in your, your, your book, I, th I think it's the playing with movement when you give a great example of a quote where they're talking about the body like it's a car, the wheels out of alignment causing pain. And and yeah, I, I'm amazed still. I, I think we 
sometimes we want to think that we don't have that concept anymore, the ideal correct movement, but it's certainly still there, right? In a lot of, you know, it's not just something we're making up. Yeah. yeah, it's there. It depends on who you listen to. You hear people, let's say, in the physical therapy community who are well aware that in the past we overemphasized or they overemphasized the role of, you know, correct biomechanics in repetitive stress injuries or, or chronic pain. And there's some communities there that have kind of recognized that and we're really getting away from this idea that you have to stand exactly the right way. You have to reach exactly the right way and run exactly the right way or else you're going to get hurt. Uh, you know, there may be some therapists or some small communities of therapists who have uh, you know, really abandoned any attempt to, to make biomechanics better. And people will say, oh, well, they say that movement doesn't matter and the pendulum has swung too far. But the reality is, for the most part, the community, the physical therapy community as a whole is still very much attached to the idea you must stand the right way, you must walk the right way, you must run the right, right way, or there's going to be a problem. Yeah, but there the, are there are communities that are very different from that. Yeah, no, I think it mirrors the sports way a lot of ways too. You know, the the knees over the toes is still you know uh, a very very prevalent. Um, yeah, so I thought you know we talk about today, and I, I you know I really love uh, your material. I think kind of a theme in your work is the idea of playing with movement, the idea of the value of learning to learn to move, <laughs> right? Yeah. Where you don't. Not, you're not necessarily looking for a specific coordination solution to learn how to serve a tennis ball, but rather, I think there's lots of benefits, probably, you're right, of exploring the movement space, right? Yeah. Can you talk but a little bit? That's exactly the way I think of it. <laughs> yeah. Is that uh, the, the idea, I, I did write a book called Playing with Movement. Play mm -hmm. was a word that seemed to kind of pull together a lot of um, uh, good ideas out there out there, and kind of put them in, in one place, you know, kind of the idea that uh, one of them is kind of the the psychological one that you, when you're intrinsically motivated to do something that leads to better learning, uh, the importance of variability. Anytime you're playing, you're, you, it's, it tends to be kind of a variable activity as opposed to highly repetitive. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that we learn well through games, the idea that we learn well through constraints and unstructured environments as opposed to environments that are too structured. So, I mean, it's just like you were saying, I, when I had you on, you say one of the things that that you see that bums you out is kids on the soccer field all standing around and uh, doing choreographed movements around cones and repetitive drills mm -hmm. instead of playing the game. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's a big theme. And do you, you know, I, I sometimes like to, I don't know, I make this separation is probably not the idea of like a capacity versus a skill. Do you think like, is, is it developing your capacity to move? Like, I think, uh, you know, both understanding the space, understanding the feel of movements. Uh, when you actually go to learn a tennis serve or, or do something very specific, do you think kind of having that, doing that playing beforehand is, makes you better able to learn the skill when you, when you start to get specific? Gives you more capacity maybe, you know? Well, I think some people have, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you, uh, what you mean by capacity and skill. So I want to come back uh, to okay. that. But I do want to answer before I forget. There are some, some uh, it reminds me that there's some uh, animal scientists who study play. What's the role of play in animals? And uh, part of the idea is that play trains you up for the skills that you're going to use when you're an adult animal. So if you are an animal that's going to rely on chasing things, you're going to play at chasing things. And an animal that relies on fighting, you're going to play fight and stuff like that. And then there's other uh, an interesting idea that animals play not just to develop specific skills, but to develop a general capacity and creativity and ability, kind of like the skill of adaptation in general. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So, so, so you can argue that if you play at something, you're going to get better at that specific thing, but you're also going to get better at learning as a general thing, because there is kind of a process to learning and you're learning what that, what that process is. You're learning how to explore, you're learning how to deal with fear. You're learning how to deal with failure, mm -hmm. kind of learning how to be creative. Yeah. No, I think, yeah, I kind of, that's exactly what I kind of, I kind of, the way I think of it is, you know, if I train, if I improve my strength and my speed kind of generally, it gives, when I go to do something specific task, I have more opportunities than someone that is slower, right? I can run through that gap. I can do things. It doesn't mean necessarily I'm going to do it, but yeah, but I, I think this general idea of 
kind of learning to learn to move. <laughs> um, you know, I think also I, I've, uh, I think you're, you're talking, when you talk about the feed, we, we talked about before we came on about feedback and sensory feedback and I think pain and injury, I think, I think you learn kind of what that is, what that is too, as well. I think you, um, I, I often found, I have this funny thing with my kids that a long time ago is I noticed they don't understand what pain is, right? They, they, um, when, when my son was like seven or eight, they, you know, he would come and I'm like, how, what is that on the scale of one to 10? He'd say 10. And I'm like, uh, if that was 10, you would be like lying on the floor, you know? So they don't, they don't kind of know what to tell me about when they were young. They didn't know I mean, I was like, oh, oh, your chest is just sore because we were you were lift you were <laughs> you're lifting things or something. But they thought it was something more serious. So yeah, it, that's a it, that's a really interesting thing. Now you yeah. probably noticed that uh, something that that most parents notice is that when their kids are out running around when they're like three and four, four first learning to run, they fall a lot, and it's mm. kind of one of their first experiences with learning about what does this mean? You know what? Mm-hmm. So I, so I, I fall, I skin my knee. What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to to run over and stop moving completely? Should I keep moving around? Is this a real injury? Is is it uh, is it a big problem? And you can think about it, like from an evolutionary perspective, this is a hugely important thing for an animal to know. When is when it, when do you have the ki- type of injury where you should take time off mm-hmm. and heal that thing? And wh- or when should you continue to forage? When you should should you continue to learn and all that kind of stuff? And that's the the question that kids are answering when they first start falling down and skinning their knee and they don't know, mm-hmm. they, they look to social information to figure this out. What's the first thing they do when they fall? They look at their parents, right? <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They look at their parents and they go, what just happened? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, they, and if the parents go, Oh my God, <laughs> sweetie. Yeah. They start crying. Exactly. Yeah. If the parent says, I think you're okay. Uh-huh. Then the kid gets up and starts playing again. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. That that that's a good, great example. Yeah. I think you know through sports we talk about you know learning whether you're injured or you're hurt or what whichever terms you want to use. You know, is it just a ding or is it something serious? And we're not always good at you know detecting that. But you're right. I think that's something we learn through movement and and exploring and, and, you know, yeah, it's, and it's the culture. It's like, there's some cultures that are no pain, no gain cultures. And they're mm-hmm. like, you play through your injury cultures. Mm-hmm. They're kind of unhealthy in certain ways, like dance. You don't talk uh-huh. about your like, classical uh, ballet. There's a culture of, you don't talk about that problem. Uh, you just go out and have a smoke. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Deal with the pain and, <laughs> yeah. And you know, it doesn't, I don't care if it hurts when you're in that weird position on your toes and, and so, you know, the, the, there's not any kind of acknowledgement that this is a problem and that happens in lots of other sports. And then there's other, uh, you know, we may be, some cultures today may be kind of making a shift in the opposite direction where all the kids are bubble wrapped and they're, they're, uh, everyone gets a trophy and it's, it's uh, everybody's really afraid of, of injury and pain and the slightest bit of stress. And it, it might be that kids aren't getting enough healthy stress uh, as a result in, in some cultures. So yeah, some it, it's a real social thing. Yeah. Uh, I know people that, that remind me of some work, you know, that I think it's in the Netherlands they've done with like playgrounds, like how we made playgrounds safer, but not given, you know, taking away the kids ability to learn. Can I jump over that <laughs> gap? Can I make that, you know, make, you know, it reduces injury, but it takes away some important, exploration opportunities for them, you know, um, you ever seen pictures of the old timey playgrounds that are just unbelievably frightening. (laughs) Yes. Kids like climbing on things that are 40 feet off the ground. (laughs) Yeah. Even, even mine when I was a kid, we had big old metal swing sets that the whole thing would rock if you got going fast enough and metals, you know, it was, yeah, yeah, for sure. They look very scary to our eyes, but maybe there's something, where those kids actually ended up being safer because they confronted uh, some risks and they kind of learned how to do it intelligently. Maybe one dies every once in a while. Maybe <laughs> we're getting it. yeah, we're gonna get in trouble here. Um, yeah, no, I think I think it's a really uh, interesting idea. And um, the uh, you reminded me, I, I was when I was looking at your book, the the one really quote: the, the benefits of coordination training for pain are probably more about playing with movement than f- fixing dysfunction. I love that that idea that you know it's more, not about the the learning about the movement 
the solution space, I think learning about the movie is so valuable. I think that's kind of the idea you're getting at, right? Yeah, it's part of the, it's one of the reasons why it's it's kind of hard to it's hard to make a change uh, in in the way physical therapy works is because you know let's say you've got uh, let's say your shoulder hurts and then there's this idea that you have to move your shoulder with the right, you know, scapulo thoracic rhythm when you're reaching above the head and you reach above the head and this is like causing some pain. So you've got to have the exact right timing of the raising of the scapula and with, with the raising of the arm. And so there's a lot of motor control exercises where you practice getting the right scapulo thoracic rhythm and you don't want winging to happen. And, and so you practice these things and, and what happens, people actually feel less pain when you're done. Uh, but then what you also notice is that there's no, there's not a good correlation between the people that got better and the people that actually changed their, their motor control. Mm -hmm. Same thing with exercises to train, you know, the right muscle activation patterns in the core, which are known to be correlated with pain. You train people to, to do those differently and then they feel less pain, but there's not the correlation between, you know, the people that changed the motor activation patterns didn't get better. So, so the conclusion is there's something about these exercises that are making people better that, that isn't actually changing the motor control. Maybe it's just exploring variable movement. Maybe it's just general stimulus of the exercise. Maybe it's a placebo effect, but the, you can see this with other types of motor control exercises that try to help with pain. Yeah. And I think you bring up a really interesting idea there that explicit, very explicit, specific instruction about how to move. Maybe it has its benefits, not because you end up there and can repeat that exact movement over and over, but it might push you into a part of space you haven't been before or, or get you to learn this is a new option. Right? Yeah, it's so, a challenge. It's yeah. a target. It's kind of like, you know, you know, to, you know, if you're told squat exactly this way, mm -hmm. you know, squat exactly this way, uh, that might help you just because it is a constraint, just because it's a challenge to coordinate mm -hmm. yourself to squat exactly that way. You could have got the same benefits by trying to squat any one of 10 other exact <laughs> yeah. ways. Yes. It didn't have to be exact. It's just like you can benefit from throwing to a target in multiple locations. The mm -hmm. point is the target. It's not the location of the target. Right. 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 You're, you're giving people a problem to solve. Yeah. Uh, and and maybe something they probably haven't done before. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, that's a benefit. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a really nice idea. I think important idea that. Uh, of this, so let get it get into some specifics. You mentioned this, and you're kind of when you're talking about your background, and this is what one of the things we we talked before about talking about the the Feldenkrais method. Yeah, for yeah. It. so is that I I looked up in my podcast. I did a search of all things. I think I mentioned it once, um, but very briefly. Um, but it's something I always been very interested in. So, is it it's a method kind of to fundamentally explore movement is that kind of a, a a way to put it can can you talk a little bit about what it is yeah and, yeah. yeah yeah so feldenkrais method developed by a guy named moshe feldenkrais who is a israeli scientist and judo guy and he kind of started developing this this kind of unusual uh mindful movement practice the purpose of which is to kind of uh give people better awareness of their body uh to train them to be more coordinated and aware in like basic movements, like postural movements, reaching movements, rotational movements, stuff like that. Uh, the reason I find it interesting is that his, um, his ideas and his methods were much more consistent with, uh, you know, kind of post Bernstein ideas. It's like, if you, if you like study Feldenkrais and then, well, I studied Feldenkrais and then I read Bernstein. And I was like, Oh, this is all, this is all the same stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, a, a, a healthy respect for variability, the mm -hmm. idea that movement kind of self-organizes uh, a lot of these ideas you can see in Feldenkrais lessons. So he, the way he teaches someone to do something uh, in a, in a more effective way, a more efficient way, a more comfortable way is he doesn't tell you how to do it and say, imitate this. He has you do the same movement repetitively under different constraints uh, in different ways, kind of paying attention to what feels good and what feels not, and kind of waits for the right for a, for a more efficient movement pattern to emerge. So mm -hmm. it's not this like top down teacher led corrective type of a thing. It's like it's based on exploration. Uh, it's based on variability. Uh, there's a woman named Esther Thelen. You, you know Esther Thelen, <laughs> the one one of the people that developed dynamic systems theory, studied child development. Mm -hmm. She kind of uh, after she wrote her book, she discovered the Feldenkrais 
method and was like, oh, this is kind of like uh, an embodiment of, of, of my stuff. And so she became an instructor. And so anyway, there's just kind of like this uh, ideological synergy between, you know, kind of the more dynamic, complex, ecological ideas about perception and action mm-hmm. and, and Feldenkrais. That's really interesting. So, so is it about giving like a specific movement problem, like yeah. reach or reach there and under maybe can you give an example yeah so here's here's an example there's many different lessons the lessons tend to last between 45 minutes to an hour where there's an instructor taking the students through kind of a semi-choreographed uh list of movements each lesson kind of has a different functional theme some one of them one might be about reaching one might be about reaching so let's say you'd, you'd be on your side and you kind of reach your hand slowly on the floor towards a certain target and you kind of take note of how far you go. Then you might perform the same reaching movement, uh, allowing the pelvis to roll in the same direction, allowing the head to roll in the same direction. Maybe make the reaching movement with just your scapula. Mm -hmm. You make the same reaching movement at different angles with different constraints. And each time you kind of note the range of motion, the comfort, the sense of effort that's involved, uh, you kind of add and subtract different body parts kind of moving in the same direction or in different directions. Uh, and the idea is that over time, you're kind of getting better awareness of which, you know, a better, a bigger vocabulary of ways to perform a task and better awareness of which ways are kind of easier and which ways are harder. Okay. And for, in reading about it, I got a kind of, um, not a differential learning, a difference learning flavor where in difference learning, you, you do two very similar things. You do it different ways so that you can compare and contrast, like the, the, reaching using this method versus that method, where I can com- compare and contrast how far far I get. Um, is there an element to that kind of contrasting? I think in your description, contrasting different solutions directly. Yeah. 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 Definitely. And yeah. and I and I don't understand the distinction you just made between difference learning and differential learning. Yeah. But 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 what you just yeah. said is <laughs> yeah yeah um difference differential difference learning is more when you do two things over and over to kind of compare the two two movement compare the differences between them versus differential learning where you try, you do different every time <laughs> uh, to it, it's kind of a, a a subtle distinction but I think. I think I think there's elements of both of them there. Um, okay. In that, in that. Um, yeah, I guess the question I think some people might have is: Is this this awareness? Is it kind of a conscious? You know, how much is it? You think explicit learning about the movement? I guess it could be, but it's but definitely more supposed to be like a subconscious thing. So Feldenkrais wanted wanted your movement skills to be, I guess, more happening in kind of an emergent type of a, so, I mean, he didn't want people to move in a certain way because the teacher told them to move in a certain way. He mm-hmm. had this phrase that says it's incorrect to correct. <laughs> I love you that. Know, you don't, you don't, you don't, tell, you don't <laughs> yeah. tell people to move in a certain way and then say, imitate this movement. Now they may be able to do the movement in a way that kind of looks like the right movement, but if the movement is being, you know, executed by some top down motor program in the top of your brain that requires a lot of conscious attention to, to execute, it's not robust. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be usable in lots of different circumstances. He want, he would want that, that movement instantiated by a more bottom up, like fine tuning of all the, the, you know, lower level reflexes, which is why you don't, he he doesn't even, even tell people what movement he's looking for in a lesson. Okay. Or what? What's a desirable outcome and what's not? It would, it would have to come from the student. So he he'd like to disguise what he thinks of as the most efficient way. Of okay. In the lesson, so the lesson, so so the intent, the, actually the point of the lesson is sometimes disguised from the student, in, in in a way that you do the movements and you kind of don't know what the lesson's about. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Is so is is there always a goal like a task goal like reaching or, put you know in, in every movement? So, so you know. That sometimes, some of the times the lessons are very obviously about a certain thing. Like there's a lesson which is about uh, moving from sit to stand okay. uh, in a more efficient way. And so the, the, the functional, the biomechanical idea is that that's going to be more efficient and, and easy uh, if you kind of get your head, head forward, you hinge at your hips, you bring the weight right over the feet by doing that. And then that kind of reflexively activates the, the quads and the glutes more effectively than kind of standing straight up like this, like some people might mm-hmm. 
decide to do without mm-hmm. like getting forward first. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of like where he wants to send people, but he's not going to say tell people that. So he's going to have you um, kind of like hinging forward from the hips like this a lot. Mm-hmm. You're not really sure why you're doing it as you're doing it. Okay. But you're kind of hinging forward from the hips and you're feeling how the weight goes into the feet. And you're hinging forward from the hips and you're feeling how the weight goes in forward into the feet. Uh, and then so you're kind of like um, performing little small portions of the task here and there. And then they kind of build up to a, to a full movement. Okay. So it's like giving your body, the self-organization system, more information, like that's, deliberately. That, yeah. That's what, that's the way he, he, he thinks yeah. about it. And it's yeah. unusual. These are original uh, types of lessons that, uh, you know, in some respects they're familiar in some respects they're, they're kind of unique to Feldenkrais and weird. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, that's really neat. Uh, it is part of an element of it that having the movement slow, like every, slow down so you can kind of get more experience of it. Yeah. It's really, it's, 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 uh, that's a really big part of it. A lot of the movements are very slow, very easy. And his idea with that was that, um, um, it's easier to detect subtle things going on in your body, easy to pay attention to things, easier to like notice errors, mm-hmm. easier to, to make corrections, you know, not so much consciously, but it's easier if you're going really, really slow. Like for example, like he wants to get rid of like parasitic tension and, and excess unnecessary tension in the movement. Like maybe, uh, you're tightening your jaw if you turn your head mm-hmm. or you, or, or something like that. Um, that's really hard to notice if you're like sprinting. Yeah. And, might be pretty easy to notice if you're walking and really easy to notice if you're lying on the floor and there's very low muscle tension and you're just uh, reaching, then it might be easy to discriminate between, is it necessary for my fist to be clenched while I'm doing this? You know, something like that. Yeah. That's yeah. the rationale. Yeah. I know them are really, really slow. The weakness is it kind of leaves out a whole class of movements that are fast, powerful movements. So film crisis really isn't about that kind of stuff. I wonder how much transfer there is from, from the slow to fast realm, you know? Yeah, no, I think that's a great, that's a great point. I think, you know, if the goal is exploration, like, so uh, the reason it came to mind, I think, you know, I think Franz Bosch kind of is one of the people that kind of criticizes doing slow down versions of it's specific different. skilled. It's qualitatively different, not just yeah. quantitatively. Yeah. And his point is you're, you're the constraints on slow movements are so less, right? There's so many different mo- ways you can move when you move slowly versus if I'm going to throw a ball at 95 miles an hour, that constraints are gone. <laughs> right? There's only so much I can do. So the, it allows for a lot of things that may not transfer. But in this case, that's what you want, right? You want exploration, room for difference, not b- being really constrained and moving just one way. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So yeah. it, it's um, I, th- there's good and bad to that to that freedom. Um, you know, that's why it's kind of like, um, that's why you're on the floor because you can move in any, any different way. And so, so I think of it, it's kind of like a way to get out of bad habits Mm -hmm. in in certain ways. Like, let's say you've got a, you've had an injury, you've had pain, and now you've got a, uh, you're avoiding a range of motion or you're habitually clenching a certain area whenever you do a certain movement. Uh, the way to become aware of that unnecessary restriction in your range of motion, that unnecessary tension is to be in a super safe environment where you're on the floor. There's no chance of falling. You're free to move in lots of different ways. And then you might kind of rediscover a a movement that was otherwise not available to you. If you're moving fast, you're going to go to the habitual thing. Right. I don't know if you've you've ever noticed, here's an example people might notice. When you get in the water, you have more freedom of movement because gravity goes down to nothing. Have you ever noticed when you get in the water Mm -hmm. that suddenly your spine is able to move in a way that it normally can't move? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I have to perceive that it's safe to get a pretty groovy kind of a spinal movement there. Yeah, oh, for sure. In the pool, I could do handstands and flips and, uh, you know, you just, you have more, you're, yeah, definitely. It doesn't mean you'll be doing it in real life. No, no, no. Yeah, I I don't, I think the key, you know, the goal here is not specific transfer, right? It's it's the awareness, uh, you know, learning to move in different ways, like giving you the body, the information to when you go train specifically, I think it it helps you. Yeah. So it's not like, yeah. yeah. So go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. When I started in Feldenkrais, I was kind of interested in getting a transfer to sports, like getting general coordination and getting Mm -hmm. a transfer to sports. I didn't notice that very much, 
but I did notice a transfer to just sitting on the couch, walking around mm-hmm. and like reaching up to get something out of the uh, cupboard. Yeah, <laughs> you know the the everyday really slow movements in life because you're doing slow movements with building cars. Yeah, no, oh, that that's a it's a really interesting idea, and that you know I think the the something you know I we dance around a lot this kind of aware body awareness feel uh, appropriate tuning in you know part of it I think is a tuning to proprioceptive information right you're, you're you're with doing all these type of movements I think we recognize the importance of it but we don't really especially in sports we don't emphasize it very much uh, yeah I was yeah. interested in your thoughts about that I was yeah. surprised that you were thinking that there is a transfer between general body awareness like knowing where something is in space. And uh, sports, because I, I, I guess my guess was that that would be kind of a, kind of a cir- circus trick that doesn't have as much transfer. But you think that that, that it does have some transfer? Yeah, I think it just it, it gives you more, I guess, information. I guess for coordinating. I, I think that's the way I would think about it. So that, that's why the a word awareness always makes me <laughs> feel a little weird saying it because I think it brings up you know kind of explicit ideas but i think yeah, the way you talk it, about it's it a lot of different things yeah i mean in field and christ one of your things that you're doing i mean the lessons are called awareness through movement lessons he said if you know what you're doing you can do what you want so he was big into it part of the reason you're lying on the floor is the floor gives you more feedback about where things are in the body so he does a lot of body scanning a lot of mm-hmm. what part of you is in contact with the floor what part of you is not in contact with the floor you lie on the floor and your low back's away from the floor well, that tells you that your low back is extended right then. It's kind of might be something that's kind of hard to feel. It's a lot easier to feel when you've got the the floor right there kind of telling you everything is. Yeah, that that's a really good point, Todd. I like that. I think it, it jobs with some of the things that we like connection balls and rubber bands and things are you're almost extending, augmenting your 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 touch, sense of touch, your proprioceptive, you know, by you know, I, I don't really know where my arm is relative to my body, <laughs> uh, my side, but if I stick an object in there, I suddenly get, you know, feel, or if I'm touching the floor, I'm getting kind of augmented information. So yeah, I, I like that idea. Connection ball. Is that what you mean by connection ball? So the connection ball is sometimes we use, we put like a big kid's rubber ball under your, under your arm and right, give right. people a task. You know, I want you to throw so that when it comes out, it goes forward. So we're giving you information now about when your body separates because you feel the the ball contact with the ball. Whereas if you're not really tuned into your body very well, you don't know <laughs> how, you know, uh, I, I remember, you know, I, when I played hockey, sometimes I get instructions, you get a coach say, you know, your hip got to do this with your hips. And I'm like, I don't know what my hips are doing when <laughs> right? I have no awareness of that, of what's going on. And so, yeah, I think that that's part of it, giving you more information about your position with the, with the yeah. floor. Yeah, the dancers have that because that's their job to be able to take instructions from the yeah. from the uh from the teacher. Your hip needs to go that way or this way. And so they they have an amazing ability to do that and then some, there's some great athletes that have no ability to do. No, that. not at all. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, I think it varies, you know, I think uh if you know, I think it would be great for any sport to do more something like dancing, figure skating, gymnastics, it, something that in, imparts more uh, focus on form and awareness. I think it would really benefit other sports. It's That's a hard yeah. sell for people that play, uh, you yeah, know, baseball or football. What all have in common is that you're moving not to accomplish a particular task. I mean, your task is to please the eye of an, an observer, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, with dance yeah. and with gymnastics, yeah. it's kind of like you're, you're moving to conform, to, to, to look good to their eye. So that's a particular kind of skill. Yeah, but I think I can see it going in the wrong direction, you know, because you get kind of you're trying to please someone else and not your yourself. Yeah, yeah, it, it's um, it's funny, you know. I've been this is a different thought. I've been having been thinking about specificity of practice and training. I was reading a paper that that, and to me, though, like the dangerous area is kind of the middle ground of it, where we try to be specific for the wrong reasons. I think, like here, the Feldenkrais method, you're not being specific at all. 
Like you're deliberately learning to just learn to move. You're not trying to reach a specific goal. I think there's lots of benefits to that. Then there's lots of benefits way at the other end <laughs> where we're going to teach you specifically to serve a tennis ball. It's when we kind of lie in the middle, I get <laughs> I think, you know what I mean? Chase yeah. Chase two rabbits, get none. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're kind of trying, because I think we try to be superficially specific sometimes for, it's almost better to break away from it totally with this kind of goal, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, so the tennis player can get in the, get in the gym and lift weights and they can go, uh, play tennis, but don't like attach a weight to the tennis <laughs> or do come some, like this. yeah, kind of an artificial drill where you're, you know, the coach is underhanding you and you're making all these shots. Yeah. <laughs> so that, but that's a different issue, but, uh -huh. but yeah, I think, um, you know, another, I noticed a, a title in your, so in one of the subtitles in your book, Options, Not Corrections, I think it, it, that fits really well with kind of this idea, right? And it's Yeah, that's yeah. kind of, I draw a distinction between corrective methods of uh, physical therapy and corrective exercise and, and corrective, um, you know, uh, sports coaching, where it's a very kind of top-down, coach-led, this is the right way to do it, that's the wrong way to do it, uh, repeat after me type of method versus go explore, figure it out. There's many different ways to, many roads to roam. Different people will have different solutions. You need multiple solutions to the same problem. Try lots out, find out what works for you, trial and error. That's the options type of a uh, yeah. method. Yeah. Do you think we we talked a little bit about this already? But uh, I've been really, you know, a few weeks ago, I did an episode on pain. Uh, I've been really interested in that. You know, the idea. I, I think you talked about the traditional way we do it is, you know, let's teach you a specific movement that avoids the pain of your injury. Um, do you see it as kind of the same kind of thing? Learning your new, like, if you think of pain as a constraint, now is it learning the new? space of what you can and can't do. Is that part of what you think physical therapy should be? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, the, um, you know, the traditional model doesn't, you know, based on that machine analogy, the, it, it doesn't respect the, the importance of variability. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the idea that, um, in a machine, any kind of variation in its movement indicates dysfunction, Mm -hmm. But in bodies, variable movement is healthy movement. It's not only functional movement, it's healthy movement. It varies where the stress goes. Mm -hmm. You know, it indicates general health of the, of the organism in, in lots of uh, different ways. It's part of what helps you uh, continue to solve a movement problem, even if one method hurts. So, yeah, just a healthier respect for, for variability. Yeah. No, I think that that's a good point, and I, I you'd like to, like you said, it's, some people are moving in that direction, and so yeah, um, well, yeah, I think that it's a really that's a really interesting idea, and um, you know, I think it does fit well with really a lot of the Feldenkrais method with a lot of Bernstein's ideas and the ecological approach ideas, definitely. I think, yeah. I think, now, yeah, another thing about pain that uh, a lot of people are, are talking about is just kind of its multifactorial nature. It's not all about tissue damage. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, you know, it's a psychosocial thing. It's about perception. It's about social things. Like we talked about before, it's highly individual. The immune system's always involved. So when someone has pain, especially chronic pain, and you're always looking to some kind of damage in the body is the only explanation you're missing out on a lot of, a lot of stuff. Yeah, for sure. It, it is. That's why it's something I, I've been interested in, but it is very, hard to conceptualize from a purely ecological information. Like there's so much about anticipating the pain, right? Um, before, when there's actually none physical stimulus there, you know, you're right. It's very complex. Yeah. Uh, or you do have the physical stimulus there, but you don't feel pain. Yeah. Yeah. You, da you dampen it, you can dampen it. And, uh, yeah. yeah, when I was, uh, I was, um, under, when I undergrad, I remember doing a lot of the phantom limb. They had a lot of the, research going on in Montreal and stuff we went and visit. It was fascinating uh, kind of the ID gate control theory of pain. They can kind of turn it on and off at will. Um, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's a really exactly. interesting complex. Yeah, for sure. 
So uh, to, to kind of end off, Ty, I thought, you know, I kind of ask you to what kind of, what, what what do you have kind of planned and going on? I, you know, you, you do. Um, so your podcast, the Better Movement Podcast, you kind of explore all these kind of topics, right? Um, do you kind of tell us a bit about you know that or any more books in the in the in the hopper? Yeah, so I've got the the podcast going on right now, where I talk to you know people like you about movement and pain mm-hmm. scientists about pain, and those are kind of the two main focuses. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I've got, a uh, got the, the old blog at bettermovement.org with kind of a lot of backlog of articles, got a new blog at, uh, toddhargrove.substack.com, which is just a, kind of a continuation of the other. Mm-hmm. I'm running some, uh, online Feldenkrais classes. Uh, you can find that in the Todd Hargrove Substack oh. thing. And, uh, I've got, uh, I'm working on a third book that's been a little bit delayed, but that, that'll probably be some sort of an evolutionary perspective on movement and it's going to talk about like different movements like uh crawling and reaching and climbing and stuff like that i'm going to try to do some uh do some uh talk about like when those movements emerged on an evolutionary time scale kind of like when they emerge on a developmental time scale uh maybe interesting parallels between those two things uh, and movement practices re- related to those movements. So it's kind of like a like a history of movement kind of an idea. You know, like what's the history of crawling? You know, it it, it you know when did animals first start doing it? And when do babies first start doing it? Yeah. Well, that sounds fascinating. You maybe bring in some of Esther Esther's work and ideas and in, in there. And yeah. Um, yeah. No. And I, and I I think we've talked about you know your two other books. I would highly recommend people oh, people thanks. check out. They're really really um i like you bring in lots of different you have a different take on the stuff than the like a lot of people that are just coaching or just pt so i i like the way you bring in lots of different things it's it's kind of a good a yeah good, it's lots of different things yeah. kind of i probably you know since i'm not uh you know i'm not a coach i'm not a physical therapist i tend not to have like the really intense specific uh knowledge but so i take a uh larger view and make some connections between different fields Mm -hmm, for sure kind of a way that it's different i suppose yeah for sure i I definitely get i would definitely say that you have that for sure you don't kind of have just narrow focus on coaching or something like that which you know i think is good for us (laughs) to see it from different perspectives sometimes so so uh thanks very much for joining me todd thanks for having me I, i liked it Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Gone straight away.